All right, you want me to introduce myself first? Uh, I uh, have a PhD from Columbia in anthropology. I specialize in biological anthropology. I did a lot of work mainly on pigments, hair, skin pigments, some photobiology and mutagenesis, uh, red hair. I did some work in neonatal intensive care unit on skin color development and so on. I like to say I worked on uh, blondes, brunettes, and redheads. Uh, I also, uh, I taught a number of places, including uh, Ohio State, University of Florida, University of Cornell, and I actually taught a, a field ornithology course at Columbia. And uh, after it was finished, the uh, class wanted me to repeat it outside of Columbia, and it's nice to be loved and appreciated. Um, I uh, was um, in the acknowledgement. Yeah. Somebody, all right. Uh, um, yeah, I keep going. Yeah, I mentioned in the acknowledgments of Peterson's Field Guide, fourth edition. Uh, but Peterson, I don't know why he did it, but it was very nice of him, too. And the uh, next, he, he passed away. In the next edition, uh, they eliminated me. Somebody said, well, who's this guy? We don't know who he is. And they got rid of me. So anyway, I've been associated also with the Kingbird um, uh, back in 1963, starting in 1963, Guy Tudor and I uh, wrote the Region 10 reports for the Kingbird for two years. Um, I also served on the uh, board of directors of New York City Audubon. And what uh, Guy and I are least known for is, uh, I, as far as I know, we created the acronym MOB, MOB, for many observers. Uh, okay, so, and I also worked for Gateway. I uh, wrote, I partially wrote and compiled, edited the uh, wildlife management plan for all of Gateway, the 1971 management plan. Did a, a field survey of colonial waterbirds for them in 1979. Uh, where I had Len Susi bring a, a prototype a barn owl box, uh, which then Don Reapy took over and uh, managed to place around the refuge. And I think that's enough about me. Uh, so I'd like to tonight uh, go over some of the very early uh, re field observations of some of the rare birds that have occurred in this area, some of the most well-known ones. Uh, this first one is a uh, red wing. Uh, it's a very old slide. This is from 1959. Uh, this bird was discovered uh, on the Saturday, although uh, Johnson, who was the head of the refuge, saw it the day before, didn't know what it was. And the next day, uh, Charlie Young and a bunch of people I did it. I got on the subway and got out there the next morning. Uh, this was taken through a, an old ball scope, Bosch and Lom scope, that I'll talk about in a minute, uh, with film. And of course, nothing like what you have today. I just held up my camera against the eyepiece. And you have, you couldn't adjust, of course, the ISO, the very slow film. And a lot of the, uh, you can see the ghost images. Uh, because it's so slow and handheld, and it's also faded quite a bit. But you can see the identifying features of the bird. Uh, there are two known subspecies, and the, this apparently is the one that breeds in uh, the Faroe Islands in Iceland. And uh, there have been a number of records. Uh, this was the first documented record for North America. Uh, the problem is that uh, John Bull was super conservative and he doubted that it was, uh, he thought it was a cage bird, something that had escaped from Kennedy Airport. Uh, but there have been a number of records since then from North America, uh, including Pennsylvania, Quebec, New Hampshire, Maine. And uh, this bird was extremely wild and didn't show any evidence of activity. Uh, 
most cage birds, they have roughed up feathers, the tail feathers are broken or whatever. This was a perfect individual, really skittish, hard to get to. Uh, this is apparently uh, also of the race that does breed in, uh, in uh, the Faroes and in Iceland. And it, it's been recently uh, colonized southern Greenland. And the other thing is most of the records are in uh, January, February when this bird occurred. And they come south. Apparently a lot of the birds spend the winter in, uh, in the north. They don't migrate, but they, during hard freezes, which was during this period, they move south. And I believe this is what happened. Anyway, uh, in 1980, this record was uh, finally accepted by the uh, New York uh, State Rare Birds Committee. So um, this apparently, as I said, is the uh, Iceland uh, race by the very heavy streaking here on the sides, a very dark bird also. Uh, this is another shot of it uh, that I lightened up in Photoshop to get you better view. You can see the eye stripe, the Rufus size, the streaking, and so on, characteristic of the bird. And uh, I think this is the only record for New York State. Uh, this is, I wanted to say, this is the scope that the picture was taken through. Uh, this is an old picture, that's me, 20 years old. Uh, that's Paul Buckley, uh, Fred Schaefer, who apparently is deceased, uh, Mickey Cashman, over here who still lives in birds on Long Island. And his son is a birder who found the uh, frigate bird uh, around Christmas a couple of years ago. Uh, this is uh, Ernie Restivo who's living in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, now, I wanna move on to the uh, albatross, the famous albatross. Uh, this is apparently the first time this picture has been seen in color on media. Uh, all the pictures in those days that were published were in black and white. The journals weren't publishing uh, in color. Um, the, this is a, from a stand from a duplicate slide taken by Paul Buckley's brother. Daniel, who unfortunately is deceased last year. Um, this was taken through an eight power binocular. He, he wasn't a birder and he came along and he got this shot uh, through the binocular. And it's a beautiful adult bird. And there, it's been, the species has been split into two species. It used to be two subspecies, the uh, Indian Ocean bird and then the Atlantic bird. And there are records of this bird, there are over 50 records from North America that go all the way from Quebec, go all the way down the East Coast around Florida into Texas. Uh, they're apparently all, mainly the, as far as we can tell, the ones that have been ID'd of the Atlantic uh, uh, species. Although there are two the two in Texas, including a specimen, are apparently the Indian Ocean bird. And I don't know if you can see it, but one of the characterizing features, which is not too visible on this photo, is the Atlantic bird has a gray head. And this is all gray, and it comes down through the um, back of the head. Uh, nowadays, everybody would have a camera. As I say, in those days, I think there were only three people on board who had cameras, and that was Paul's uh, brother. Uh, Joe Gell had a eight millimeter, or I think it was eight millimeter, 16 millimeter Bolex uh, movie camera. And uh, this is from a print that he gave me from the uh, movie. And uh, you can see this bird, it's a flight shot. Some of the characteristics, uh, the white down the center, bordered by black with a larger black in front. Uh, this bird uh, was just a couple of miles off Jones Beach. And uh, this is a picture that I took with my camera, with a 
Nikon uh, F, and uh, it was a brand new camera. The Nikons had just come out with single lens reflexes, I believe, the year before. And this was with a normal 58 millimeter lens. The bird was about 40, 50 feet from the boat. And you can see the Jones Beach Tower in the background. And here's the bird sitting in the water. Um, what I, I wanted to, let me see here now. Um, there were two boats at the time. Um, and there were about maybe 40, 50 people. This was in 1960, by the way, May 30th. Um, I want to, let me see, I want to blow this up a little. Uh, let me see if I can get it working here. Uh, there we go. Okay, uh, say this was 1960. There's Bobby Goshfeld, who was Doug Goshfeld's father. Mike Goshfeld is John Bull, uh, Ricky Harrison. Uh, those of you who didn't know Ricky, Ricky was a very uh, famous cartographer. And uh, after he died, his studio and all his equipment was purchased by the Smithsonian. He, uh, he pioneered a lot of uh, early techniques in cartography. And all the Rand McNally roadmaps he used to get at gas stations were his. And he used to insist on using uh, the ink he used was Pelican as a bird watcher, you might guess so. And his, all his lettering was done freehand, by hand. And it's absolutely amazing. Of course, there were no computers in those days. And in fact, even in those days, cartographers, a lot of them used mechanical means and he didn't. Uh, I also wanted to point out uh, about Ricky. Uh, a lot of you owe the fact that you're birding in the Ramble in Central Park to Ricky. Uh, there are a lot of harebrained schemes that were introduced to Central Park over the years, one of which was putting in a racetrack around the uh, reservoir. Uh, one was a thousand feet theater, one was a cemetery for the uh, prestigious uh, New York City deceased. And in 1955, uh, Robert uh, Moses decided he wanted to put an old age home, a senior center in the Ramble. He wanted to um, bulldoze 33, uh, 14 acres of 33 acres of the Ramble, build a building, fence it off with uh, croquet field and shuffle boards and fence it off. And Ricky, there was a big uproar, uproar about this, particularly among the birders. And Ricky was in one of the people in the forefront of defeating it. Okay, now let me go back. Of course, things have changed a lot since then. Uh, we had two boats. Uh, for years, uh, I had been observing birds from uh, the boardwalk, for example. And it's the only way I could get to the ocean and in the car subway at uh, Rockaways and doing pelagic birding. Um, and uh, in fact, uh, Chef Carlton, one point when they asked him what I he thought I would be reincarnated as, he blurted out shearwater. Uh, and today, these are the boats that go way out. Uh, things have changed a lot. Uh, you have to be licensed by the Coast Guard to go out of 100 miles. We now go through Paul Wagics. We go out now overnight, well over 100 miles. And uh, it's quite uh, scientific these days. Uh, they look at the latest satellite technology of water temperature and other things to see where the birds might be that we're after. Uh, this is a, uh, re a photograph taken by Taylor Shum from uh, Bob Moses uh, Field 2 in 2017 in May. Uh, this is another albatross. Uh, 
that he got through his telescope using a, I think it was an iPhone. And this, uh, it's amazing what pictures you can get these days. And if you don't carry a camera, uh, it's good. Most, all birders carry cell phones and binoculars and you can get an adapter and you should carry it around to document things. Uh, I might talk about some of the uh, previous uh, records and uh, about this uh, trip. Uh, I mentioned, I showed you before uh, this picture. Uh, this woman here was extremely seasick. And when they found the albatross, uh, she wouldn't get up to look at it. And she said, even if it was Jesus walking on the water, she wouldn't get up. Uh, nowadays, of course, there are, I used to get really seasick too, but nowadays there are good medications to prevent that. Uh, so Peter, I'm Peter, gonna, Peter yeah. who, who, who was that, Debbie Harper? I don't know who that was. Uh, everybody I know who was on the boat didn't seem to know. It's probably Debbie Harper from Scarsdale. Yeah, okay, that's good to know. Anyway, uh, Dave Sonneborn, who was on the boat also, uh, he sent me this nice note. Uh, he said, at the end of the day, we were about 1.5 miles off of Jones Beach, and I was standing near the captain who said, quote, what is that bird? And Dave said, I looked and said it was a great black back gull. And he said, quote, no, it looks funny. So Dave said, I looked again and said again, it was a gull. About the third iteration, John Bull said something to the effect that if it were in the Southern Hemisphere, it would be an albatross. I think that's a neat little thing there. Uh, there are a number of uh, records, as I say, for uh, New York, and this being one of the later ones. Uh, there was one at, at uh, Rob Moses State Park in uh, May of 2000 that was photographed uh, standing on the beach. Uh, there have been other New York records. Uh, there was one by Ed Daly, who by the Narrows uh, in Brooklyn, he had one fly over his head, an unidentified albatross heading inland. Um, is a record for, I think, Gardner's Island. Anyway, they do show up. Uh, the interesting thing is that most of these yellow noses are in the south, uh, along the uh, US. And there are a couple of black-browed records, but most of them are in the northeast sector of the Atlantic, North Atlantic, more along uh, the British Isles. And apparently that's because of the cooler waters in that area. Um, there also is a interesting record of a uh, albatross primary feather that was picked up on uh, 7th November 1948 by DJ Nichols of the American Museum. And he was attracted to the fact that it had a strong and oily smell. Uh, the feather was uh, identified definitely by Robert Cushman Murphy as a, a as a yellow-nosed albatross, probably naturally uh, malted uh, feather. Now, the interesting thing about uh, all these records, uh, a lot of them are from shore or they're inland. In fact, there's one from upstate New York. Um, and a lot of them are, are on the beach, and flying or patrolling back and forth, or they by uh, observers who have seen them flying inland. And uh, it's believed that these are birds that are uh, dispersing and looking for new uh, nesting habitat. In fact, uh, one of the interesting records was from Kate May, uh, Shawnee Finnegan, a few years back. Uh, let me see if I have the date here. Um, also in 2000, she was riding uh, about six miles north of Cape May City on the Garden State Parkway, looked out the window, and there was an albatross uh, paralleling her car flying over the grassy median strip. Uh, this uh, bird was seen a few days later, definitely identified as a yellow nose. Um, anyway, that was a terrific trip. Uh, we had just about everything you could want. Uh, not 
every boat got everything. We had all three Jaegers, uh, both foul ropes, uh, lots of Wilson's petrels. Uh, we had four leeches petrels. Um, let me see, long-tailed Jaeger. Um, and there were three species of shearwaters, including the earliest record by a month of corgis.